even really great improvements on something that is not your bottleneck can be an absolute waste of time and money. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And today we'll be talking about bottlenecks, constraints, also the theory of constraints as a, an improvement concept. And we'll be linking it to focused improvement, either as specifically the TPM pillar, but also more broadly as a concept for continuous improvement. And on that, by the way, on how that is linked, we'll also have a very nice learning resource that I found over at beltcourses.com. Link is down below. Go check that out as a nice free learning continuation with some exam questions triggering you. Really nice. We'll get back to that at the end of the video as well. So constraints and bottlenecks, they are almost the same. Uh, probably for practical intents and purposes, they are the same as well, right? So we still want to talk a little bit about the difference, but you will quickly see that when you are going into improvement mode, it doesn't really matter which one of the two you pick. So a bottleneck, very technically, is any line or any process that uh, is up to its max capacity. It's one way of looking at it. Or whose capacity is lower than the demand placed on it. Now, if we have a market demand for 100 products an hour, let's say, right? any of our lines that produce less than 100 products an hour, they are a bottleneck, right? They, they are under the capacity that is needed. So this one here, so these two, mm, sort of yes, sort of no, because each one of them by themselves could not fix uh, enough products, could not produce enough to reach the capacity demand, so the, the capacity of one of these processes is too low, but because they're in parallel together, they can't produce enough. Well, you know, in these circumstances, usually it pays handsomely if you could all do it on one of them. And you can remove the need for all the resources around the second machine, the second process also working. And quite often, one of the two will be uh, cheaper in production. But it will not improve the throughput for your whole system, so be a bit careful. Right? Also, if you do manage to fully get rid of that one because you improve the capacity, the productive capacity of one of them, you, you still have invested in the line already. It is taking up space. You can sell it, you probably not get the same money. So a couple of things that you know, as accounting tricks that especially uh, Ali Goldrad in the Theory of Constraints books really warns us against, that'll make this seem better than it actually is for your production. Now, when we look at constraint, and that is from this body of theory, we look at that process, that machine, that um, limits the throughput of the entire system. And there can be only one constraint at any one time. There's a whole thing about the jumping bottlenecks in, in the books. You really, you really need to read the goal. It's a, it's a brilliant book. After that, you'll probably want to read the other ones as well. But the main message, there's only one constraint. And the constraint is the one that slows down the whole process. So that one, the slowest one out there, that is the constraint. Now, once we find it, we need to start working on it. And there is sort of a five-step program. There's a whole bunch of nice things in the theory of constraint method. There's a five-step program that is nice to sort of repeat here, just to get into that way, that terminology. And we'll get into the more the focus improvement stuff afterwards, but you'll see a lot of similarities. So the first thing to do is to identify where the constraint is, like we just did. Right? So we sort of already finished step one in this one. Of course, in practice, this is going to be a bit harder. right? You've got more complex production change. You will uh, maybe also have that after such a process, it splits out, not just in and then. Uh, I understand it is more difficult, although a nice quick trick 
is to spot where is the working process, where is the whip. And if you have a lot of product waiting here, so at the gates of that one, that one, and or that one, you know that the next process is most likely your constraint. Do you identify it? Then exploit. And exploit is it's basically making sure that it runs as well as it can at the moment. Right? So it, the cleaning should be at least quick and we don't want to do a bunch of difficult orders for that one. And uh, we, we don't want any sort of time sinks. For instance, if that machine uh, goes down on brakes by the, by the people, right? uh, the brakes, not machine brakes, then get rid of that problem. Make that machine the only one in the plant where when the operator has a coffee break, somebody else comes in, takes over the machine, they run it, and the machine does not stop. Well, things like that. Or um, when they have a changeover, you make sure that stuff is prepped, that maybe indeed again you have some help. All kinds of things like that. So you exploit that current process, that current machine and, and the things around it as much as possible without you know, really digging deep into how the whole thing works and investing in a new machine or uh, the, so just how it is right now, let's do the quick and dirty things that can just make it run better. Then subordinate the rest of the plant, the rest of all of your lines to this one. So you will see in planning that most organizations sort of try to optimize everything and to make it very efficient to go through each of the stages of production. And for that, sometimes this one gets you know, a bit more uh, product changes and other stuff that that'll just cost time or the order in which they have to do things is not ideal, but it sort of helps this line. So that deadline gets a very nice and high OE. And by just putting a little bit of damage to this one, now on paper that might look wonderful, but in most practices, the real money is made by getting stuff out the door, right? Not by having all of your machines running at brilliant efficiency. No, this is the one that needs to run at its maximum efficiency. And don't forget that when I wrote here, the 80, the 90, the 150, that is not the plate speed or the name plate capacity or the maximum speed that that process, that machine can run at. Now, this is the, the operational speed. So this includes, uh, you've got some downtime for product changes or cleaning. You've got some downtime because sometimes it just breaks down, right? Uh, speed is maybe not at its highest setting, things like that. In our terms, the OEE, the overall equipment effectiveness, is not 100%. This could be a line that can actually do 160 as well. It's just running at 50% OE. So by doing these first effects, you can take away parts of those OEE time sinks and just get the capacity up. Elevating, the next step, that is when we really tackle issues in that process in that machine. Maybe we invest in a new machine for that place, but that is the expensive route. Now, at some point, you will probably need to replace the machine and then you'd better also replace it with something that really fits the purpose. But in most situations, in many plants, you don't really want to invest in it. That, that is the expensive, not efficient way to solve it. You want to sweat the current assets, which means really, really get the most out of it. This is when your Six Sigma projects and your uh, Lean and Kaizen and uh, pro uh, process redesign and all kinds of things like that really come into play. Right? You really understand every part of that process and make the smaller improvements. Sort of, as a rule of thumb, the, the less than $100,000, uh, euro, pound, that, that, those type of currencies, not, not $100,000, uh, what is it, rupees, but a, a good serious engineers yearly salary roughly or a bit more that is up until that point I, I would still call it a relatively small improvement this is still more sweating the asset if we really go over it'll become an investment process and project but you elevate the actual process so you improve the standards and you see here the tie also back into when we work with standards 
we first of all want to make sure that we do everything up to standard by troubleshooting, by problem solving, and then we improve the standard itself further. It's in here just in a different language. And then one of the important things as well, it's almost not a step, but repeat this process. So identify your next constraint. It, it should not be this, the same one, because if you really did this in a good way, maybe you have done three or four teams. Right? So one improvement team might not be able to do everything to remove this one as a constraint. One improvement team might actually just take a part of the, well, the, the setup time, setup time reduction. Great, right? That's part here. But your organization will go through this and have a number of improvement efforts. And at some point you say, well, this is actually probably not the constraint anymore. Let's identify what is now our constraint. And if we do that in this one here, so let's say we, we do make it quite a nice and, and good system now. We'll make it 110, which means that the new constraint sort of moves, right? The constraint jumps to another process. Now, that last part of our complete production process became a constraint, and we go through that again. At some point, the market will become the constraint, which is also nice, right? So, uh, Ellie Goldratt advises to keep your uh, manufacturing under market demand, so to be happy that you have a constraint that is in your factory, uh, because that way you will just always be working and you will have the power to steer your sales instead of the other way around. Uh, but um, most organizations, they, they do at least sort of want to be able to serve that market that they know is there. But as soon as you go over that, working on the market is also a big thing. So work with your sales, work with ways to do also in, in those theory of constraint books, really nice things. Anyway, that repeat is a step. It's because it is so important to not forget. And that is one of the big warnings that Goldratt gives us, is that it can become your constraint that you stop improving. Now, how, how better to say that you need to be doing continuous improvement, right? So that is also how nicely this links in to uh, some of the other continuous improvement concepts. And as I said, focus improvement is a big one of them. So when you take the more narrow approach to focused improvement as a pillar within the TPM system, what you will see there is that sort of step one is to do a good cost analysis and specifically capacity and labor studies of your entire process to identify where your constraints are. Now, the difference sort of between theory of constraints and many of the other continuous improvement ideologies is that theory of constraint really focuses on throughput first, so just volume onto the market. They will do it in uh, net sales revenues, or sales minus the direct production cost, like the materials that go in there, not the labor. Getting into the details maybe too much. Throughput and inventory to go down, and only then other types of cost. Most of the other improvement ideologies, they will take cost into account pretty much from the start, right? So take also the labor efficiencies and the material efficiencies into account. But what focus improvement uh, will do is to really identify where do we need to focus our improvement efforts. Then the nice thing is that in the methods that this pillar themselves manage as teams and, and really have to develop is the, the setup type of losses. So make your setup time shorter, make your setup waste slower, make sure that all of your routine type of stoppages, your cleanings, your product changes, your machine setups, your um, overhauls, that all of those are tackled. Those are really in the exploit thing, right? They're not really improving how well the line is performing. They're taking out all kinds of time sinks that are not the real process itself. They're, they're definitely important. I mean, don't stop cleaning, especially if you're in the food industry or, or pharma or something like that. But 
they exploit the resource themselves. And then they also have to share this uh, priority, this focus with the other pillars, with the steering committee, with the other pillars, with other teams. So they focus the whole improvement organization on, okay, you should be improving that part, you should be improving that part so that the total operations will grow the most. So they will tell the other departments to subordinate stuff, especially the planning department, but also a different production department. Like, this machine's OAE is not important. Do everything to make that one work, right? A planning thing and a focus thing, and to elevate it. So they will send out your maintenance and your quality pillars to really go into getting specifically that machine up and running, having the utilities around that machine always on. So you, you see that this focused improvement pillar and this constraint concept, they really blend in nicely together. And then of course, they make sure to repeat that process. When you have a wave of teams uh, that uh, gave their results, the focus improvement pillar is the main one that will check you know, what was the overall effect. Uh, all of the teams and their pillars, they will check what was the contribution of each of those projects. But the focus improvement pillar is the main one driving so what did they do to the overall output and cost? And so they have that picture. And that makes it really interesting for somebody in focused improvement or in that side of the business, definitely any TPM or continuous improvement manager, but also focused improvement pillar members, pillar leads, get some training on theory of constraint, or at least read through the concepts. Very good things to do. Know that you don't have to go over to that way of accounting and that single-minded focus. You can, but it, it is more important that you uh, stick with your organization's improvement philosophy in a good way than try to cherry-pick from different systems. That's just a bit of practical advice. Uh, not saying that TPM is better than theory of constraints. I am saying that an organization that picked going with theory of constraints and puts all their systems in this mindset, they will do better than an organization that sometimes does a bit of this, sometimes a bit of that. Right? Any of the philosophies, I am convinced, can work in a good way. But you, you need to have a whole company culture behind it. and that you know, It's not a thing you want to break. But if you want to learn more about how to get you know, with the concept of constraints and when should you tackle which parts? How do you make that priority? Uh, how do you put that focus? Learn a bit more on focus improvement combined with constraints. And you can do that, as I shared at the beginning of the video, uh, at a free course by beltcourses.com. A very nice resource. So they select a number of videos from, from different sources, including a couple of mine, that's how we met. And uh, they made it into mini programs that have some theory, a couple of videos, then some triggering exam questions. It's a self-exam, right? But it'll trigger you to take the learnings from the videos. It's a really nice way of learning. So they, they studied on more adult learning and how to retain knowledge from just a video and put that in. Really cool resource. Follow the link down below. What you will also see is that they offer at larger programs where you go through a guided learning journey. Now these, I think you will probably want to do more from, let's say your company, I would have the company pay if they can. Uh, so discuss it more with your manager, with your team. You don't have to fill a whole team. This is a team-based learning concept that they have that also you know, elevates each, each other's learning because you do it together. You don't, as a company, have to fill all the spots in one of their courses, they will mix and match for you. So if you just have maybe just yourself or two or three people within your team that would like to really get into a number of those trainings, that's not a full group, but you will meet people from different companies, maybe even different industries, and still have that combined learning. Very cool, check that out as well. The link down below, it even gives you a free training on focused improvement and how it works together with this idea of constraints, lifting them and making sure that everywhere in your organization you're putting the focus where it belongs. Really cool stuff. And also one of the things I like about you know, continuously improve yourself, don't forget to also do that part and enjoy your personal continuous improvement journey.